In this video tutorial, I'm going to show you step-by-step -step how to design a custom printed circuit board that's based on a wireless Bluetooth microcontroller. We're going to be using the free PCB design software called KeyCAD, which you can download so you can follow along. Also, in the description below, there's a link so you can download the design files for this project, including the KeyCAD design files, along with a PDF of the schematic. Okay, so this is the schematic for the design that we're going to be creating the printed circuit board for. And I'm just going to do a quick review on everything in the schematic, and then we'll get started with the printed circuit uh, board layout. This is a wireless Bluetooth microcontroller module um, that we're, we're using here. This is the Ublox Nina B306 module, Bluetooth module, Bluetooth low energy. And this is, includes a Nordic NRF52840 Bluetooth microcontroller. So the, the, the main heart of this module is the, the Nordic microcontroller because it has the Bluetooth radio built in or Bluetooth low energy radio built in. The main thing that this module adds is it adds the antenna. So it, it has a PCB antenna that's on the, just on the kind of the edge of it here. And using a module, anytime you have wireless functionality, if you use a module, you're going to drastically simplify the design because any RF design is always complicated and uh, is, is prone to making mistakes. But perhaps more important is in regards to FCC certification. Any electronic product is going to require FCC certification if anything oscillates above 9 kilohertz, which is almost all products. However, if, you're, if your design has any wireless functionality, you can drastically simplify the FCC certification and drastically lower the cost if you use a pre-certified wireless module that has the antenna ideally built in. The key is you, you, if the antenna is not built in and it's a module with an external antenna, then you have to be careful that you use the same antenna that was used for the certification. But this one has the antenna built in. It's just a little PCB antenna. Okay, so I'm going to just start up here in the corner. Uh, we, we have a USB port here, a USB connector, and we're using this for two purposes. Is one, we're using this to power the board. Uh, this simple design doesn't really have a battery or anything like that. So it's going to get its power from the USB port. And a USB port uh, provides a 5 volt supply. So what we have here is the USB port. And we basically, we're, we just have our VBUS, which is the 5 volt DC supply. Then we have our two, there's two data lines. There's a D plus and a D minus for a USB communication. You're going to have just those two data lines. And then you just have the ground or in the shield, which is also tied to ground. And what we have here is we have our 5 volt coming out of here. And this 5 volt is going to feed directly into the module. And this V bus is for the USB portion of the module of the, uh, the microcontroller, but it is not the primary power supply for the module. That will be a 3.3 volt supply, uh, which will generate from this 5 volt supply. But you do, when you're, because we're doing USB communication, we need to also power this, provide 5 volts to the V bus pin. And all we have here is this is a ferrite bead, just an inductor that with the capacitors here, and this just uh, helps uh, reject any high frequency noise. And then, so the DC just flows right through here and you get five volts on the bus. Then we, down here, then we also, we have an ESD protection circuit for our USB connector. So anytime you have, I.O. lines of any type that go to the external world that your consumer may or that your uh, customer may end up touching. Let's say they walk across a carpet, they build up all this static electricity and they touch the USB port. Well, that can create that will create a, a really high voltage uh, spike, which would normally could damage uh, the the microcontroller here that is connected to those data lines. So what you have are these ESD uh, diodes. This is a circuit here. You can see the part number here that's specifically for USB. Uh, it's got the it's got just the the two I/O protection uh, lines here, 
because there's two for USB. Then you, this is for the USB uh, power here, and you can see it's, and then it's got ground. So there's a, a diode, a reverse bias diode between the USB five volt and ground. And that just prevents, that's gonna prevent that from ever going more than a diode below ground if it were to uh, try to pull it below ground. So this just basically protects uh, the, the microcontroller from any ESD strikes. Okay, and then uh, then we just, here's the two data lines. We have the USB plus, D plus and D minus. Uh, we don't have the antenna connected up because that we're using the module version that has the built-in antenna. Then most of these other lines are all just GPIO or general purpose IO input output that can be programmed for different functions. So for instance, this one here I'm using to turn on an LED. And I've also got another second LED over here tied to this GPIO 41. And the main reason I just included two is I just wanted to give you two examples uh, of the way you can power things from the GPIO pin. So this configuration here, the microcontroller is sourcing the current. So sourcing current means it's flowing out of the pin of the GPIO. So it's basically the current's coming from the microcontroller pin. So it's sourcing the current, which then flows through the LED and through this resistor, the resistor is here to set how much current can flow. You don't want too much current. If you didn't have this resistor, you would just uh, get a lot of current flowing through this diode and it would just end up damaging and uh, damaging the diode. So that's the purpose of this particular uh, resistor is to set that current. And so this is a sourcing configuration. Whereas, oh, and to, so to just turn this diode on, you just turn on GPIO1. You make it go high, which will be 3.3 volts, and then that's a 3.3 volt supply here that feeds and sources that current. This configuration here, the microcontroller IO line is going to sink current. So sinking current means the current's flowing into that pin. Uh, so we've got the 3.3 volt supply here at the top now. And what happens is if, if we make this go high, or even high impedance. So let's say we sort of turn it off so it's not high or low. For now, we'll just say it's high. Well, what happens is you don't get any voltage difference here, so you, you have no current flowing through here. What happens is, if you, on this case, if you want to turn on this diode, then you just need to ground, you, you make GPIO 41 low, so it's grounded, and then the current can flow through the diode, through the resistor to ground. Then over here, we just have our SDA and SCL. These are the two lines that go with the I2C serial interface. And I2C is just a really simple two-wire serial protocol that you can use to transmit data between different, usually different chips on a printed circuit board. It's, it's ideal for sensors and things with low data rates. Uh, you would never want to try to send audio data or video data or anything like that through I2C. It's a really slow, simple interface, but it's fantastic for simple uh, s sensors that don't really, you know, they may just, like in this case, we're using one sensor. I'll go ahead and jump over here. We're, our board mainly just has a temperature humidity sensor. And you can see it's got the two SCL and the SDA. So it communicates, it feeds into the microcontroller through these two lines. SCL is a clock, and the clock will be output from the microcontroller because the microcontroller serves as the master. It's outputting the clock, and then that's an input to the sensor. The data line is bidirectional, depending on which way the direction the current or the data is flowing from the microcontroller to the sensor or from the sensor to the microcontroller. So we just have those two lines, and that's the only sensor that we're using on this board. So effectively, this design is can read temperature and humidity, and then you could use the microcontroller with Bluetooth low energy capabilities to transmit that to a mobile app, for instance. And I, I do want to clarify one thing, that this uh, Bluetooth low energy is not what you would want to use if you were doing streaming audio. For streaming audio, you need to either use Bluetooth Classic 
or you need to use Bluetooth 5 that supports, it specifically has to support what is called LE, so low energy audio. If it doesn't support that, then you do not want to use it for streaming audio. You, you could use it to transmit an audio file, but you do not want to use it for streaming audio. But for this one, we're just using it for transmitting sensor data. Okay, we're going to work our way around here. Uh, we just have some pins that are grounded here. These are all grounded. And there are actually in this module a bunch of pins that need to be grounded. There's maybe 10 ground pins. And instead of having a separate pin on each, uh, you know, each pin being displayed here in the schematic, I've just kind of overlaid them all together. And that's why you can, if you zoom in, you, can, you can't really read the numbers because there's a bunch of pins stacked on top. And then that way I just have this single connector connecting it to ground. The same way with over here, these are a bunch of pins tied to ground. Okay, then we have, uh, we already, this is our temperature humidity sensor, pretty simple circuit, connects to the microcontroller through I2C like we already discussed. Then you just need a ground, a power supply, with a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor. And then there is this VC, which is a, it's an internal voltage. And uh, you need to just supply, basically put a 100 nanofarad cap from that to ground. There's not really a whole lot you need to worry about with this pin. This is uh, really just something that's internal to the microcontroller, but it needs this capacitor on it. And then we are powering this you could power this directly from your 3.3 volt supply, but then because there's no enable pin, you don't have any way to turn this off. So I'm going to instead power this from a GPIO. So if I don't want this on and I want it to not be wasting power, then I can just turn this VDD underscore ENV or enable voltage. I can just set that low and then that will this will go low and that will of course turn this off because it has no power. If I want this on, then I'll just turn this high, and then that will supply 3.3 volts. You have to be careful. You can't power really high current through these GPIO pins, but this thing takes really little current, so you can power it directly through a GPIO pin. Uh, then we just have our two pull-up resistors here. These are a requirement for I2C. Basically, the outputs that drive I2C lines, they can pull things low, but they can't pull it high. So you have to have this resistor, which will serve as a, that's why it's called a pull up. When the internal transistor is inside the, the chips that are using the I2C, whenever they're not pulling this to ground, so the switch here tied to ground, when that's turned off, then these resistors uh, just pull it up high. So you wanna make sure you have that. Usually, you know, something, 2.2 kiloohms, maybe up to 10 kiloohms. I'm using 4.7. Then we have our, uh, we have here um, our, our reset line for the microcontroller. This, whenever this goes low, this just resets the microcontroller. And here, this is a little reset circuit. So what this does is it power up this capacitor briefly looks like a short. So that pulls this reset low, but within a few microseconds, this capacitor charges up. And once it charges up, it looks like an open circuit. So no current can flow. So now this resistor pulls it high. So what this little circuit does is it just creates a little quick down spike at power up to reset the microcontroller. There's also a switch here that you can add that if you want to do a manual reset, you just press this. It does the same thing. You press and release it. It just pulls this low, this reset, um, and then that just uh, resets the microcontroller. Then we also want the reset line tied into our programming connector uh, so the programmer can reset the microcontroller. And I'm going to talk about this here in just a moment. I just want to make sure we've got everything. And then we have our, uh, the last thing on the microcontroller is the VCC line we have here for the power, then we have VCC for the, the, this is the main supply voltage and the main supply for the IO pins. You can have two different uh, voltages. We've got them tied together, each with a decoupling capacitor. And I can see here, uh, one thing uh, I've, I didn't do is uh, I didn't connect this to the actual supply. So I'm going to just copy 
this there. So now we have our 3.3 volt supply that powers it. And then these are the decoupling capacitors. Okay, so the programming port, we have the USB port. And if you're used to programming an Arduino, and speaking of Arduino, this board that we're designing is very similar to the Arduino Nano 33BLE. In fact, they use the exact same module for that for that board. And then they also, uh, I'm using the same temperature humidity sensor. There's also the Arduino Nano 33BLE Sense, which has this same module, and it's got a lot of other sensors on it. We're just using the one sensor here. So this board is very closely modeling the Arduino Nano 33 uh, BLE. The, the main difference is, is that we're, instead of using a switching regulator, we're using a more simple linear regulator, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So if you're used to Arduino, normally you program things through the USB port. However, that requires what's called a USB bootloader be installed on the module or in the microcontroller that allows you to program it through the USB port. Well, the Arduinos come with this bootloader installed, but when you just do your own custom board, that's not the case. You're going to have to upload the USB bootloader so you can program using the USB port and just using Arduino IDE, just like you would with a normal Arduino. The problem is, is, well, if you need the bootloader to be able to program it through the USB, how do you program it to have the bootloader? How do you upload and burn the bootloader? Well, that's where you need to use the native programming port. So there are, this particular microcontroller uses what's called SWD or serial wire debug, and it's just a two wire programming interface. So you can see here, there's a clock and there's an IO line, a data line. So it's very similar to I2C in that regard that it has a clock and a data line. And the problem with, the reason you don't use it like an Arduino, you don't program it this way is because it requires a special piece of hardware because the Arduino IDE, you can just connect USB directly from the Arduino to your board. However, if you don't have the bootloader, you need to make sure you have a native programming interface. And this requires a special piece of hardware called a, just a, a programmer. And there's a specific one that you have to, to use for this. And I'll, I'll include that uh, in the uh, description below that the a link to the bootloader or that not the bootloader, but the, uh, the programmer that you can use to program this microcontroller so you can upload the bootloader. And if you wanted to, you can always do all of the programming through the serial wire debug interface if you wanted to, but if you want to, you know, not have to deal with that programmer and you want to just do like you do with a normal Arduino, then you would upload the bootloader and then program after that using the USB port. Okay, so that's everything connected to the microcontroller. The last thing I want to go over is the power supply. So the, it's pretty simple. We're just taking our five volt supply in. I'm feeding it through a linear regulator, which is a really simple type of voltage regulator that outputs 3.3 volts. Now on the Arduino Nano 33 BLE, they instead use a much more complex switching regulator. And the reason being is that they also allow you to power it from a 22, up to a 22 volt supply. So if you're going from a really high voltage, like 22 volts, all the way down to 3.3 volts, well, that puts a huge voltage difference across the regulator. And that means it ends up dissipating a lot of power and it would overheat, damn it. It's not only wasted power, but it can overheat and damage the, the voltage regulator or most likely like this particular chip has a thermal shutdown. So it will just keep shutting down because it, it got too hot. If that, so we wouldn't want to do that with 22 volts. That's when you would want to use a switching regulator, which are really efficient and don't burn or waste power at taking a real high voltage and stepping it down to a low voltage. Or if you had really high currents, we don't really have high currents or high input voltages. We're just doing five volts down to 3.3. So that's only a voltage difference of 1.7 volts. So that's going to be, you know, for the, 
few milliamps of current that we're pulling that's going to be very little power and not really heat this device up. But if you were going to power this from a much higher input supply, then you would want to make sure you use a switching regulator. And then all we have is some decoupling capacitors on the input, the output, or two on the input. We have a 10 microfarad and 100 nanofarad. Then on the output, we're just doing a single 2.2 microfarad. And then we have this BP, which is called a bypass pin, which has a capacitor. And what this capacitor does is it, it basically filters out noise and improves power supply rejection on the internal reference voltage. So any voltage regulator has an internal reference. And what this is doing, like if you measure this voltage here, it'd be about 1.2 volts. That's the, the voltage reference that it's using. And this capacitor just helps make it uh, eliminate any noise or power supply rejection. So if the input is like all of a sudden starts switching or gets noise on it, a high power supply rejection uh, regulator like this one, that ripple will not make it to the output. It will be nice and smooth on output, and that's the purpose of this capacitor here. And just in general, a linear regulator is always going to have a much smoother output than a switching regulator. Switching regulators, the output, if you look real close, it would be 3.3, but if you zoom in, you'll see it will have little glitches on it from the switching. And that's fine for digital circuits like a microcontroller. That noise isn't going to have a problem. But if you had sensitive analog or some audio circuitry, something like that, then you wouldn't want to, you would want to filter that out. And one of the best ways is to use a switching regulator on the front end, maybe step down your 22 volts down to 5 volts, then feed that into a linear regulator, and then that will clean up the output. And then you can take the output from the linear regulator. Don't forget, there's a link in the description below so you can download all of the design files for this project, including a PDF of the schematic. Before we begin working on the PCB layout itself, we want to first do what's called an electrical rules check. If you In KiCad, if you go under Inspect and Electrical Rules Checker, or just ERC, you'll see this abbreviated, abbreviated as. So I'm going to, this will come up and then you can do run ERC. And you can see here, for me, it is showing zero errors and 10 warnings. I'm going to ignore the warnings because uh, most of the warnings are for pins not connected up, which in this case, I've got so many unconnected pins. I'm not really worried about these, uh, about any unconnected pins. But what you can do is you can control the electrical rules that it uses when doing this ERC. If you go under File, Schematic Setup, then you can see Electrical Rules. And here is where you can define is a, if a violation of a rule, does it give an error, a warning, or ignore. And you can see here I've got pin not connected set to ignore. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of them here. I'm not going to go through these and uh, explain them each individually for this particular video, but just know that you need to do an electrical rules check, and if you're going to fabricate the design, it's probably a good idea to it, it not ignore more than, you know, the, the bare minimum. Obviously, you want to you catch certain things if you've got a pin that's unconnected, if it's a pin that's a problem if it's unconnected, uh, that type of thing, you, you definitely want to catch that. But for this particular tutorial, I've got most of these either set to warning or ignore. So when you run your inspect electrical rules check, odds are you're going to see some a bunch of errors here and warnings. And you can, you can go through and, and look at those individually if, if you'd like, or you can just uh, turn those off for this particular tutorial and... Uh, not, I'm not going to focus too much on the, the errors. And besides, this tutorial is really more about the PCB layout than, you know, than how to design the schematic circuit diagram. Okay, so now that we've got the ERC clean, the next step is, is to begin on the PCB layout. And in KiCad, what you can do is you go under Tools, and you can do Update PCB from Schematic. I'm just going to click on that. And you can do, uh, I'm just going to ignore these options and just do update PCB and then close this. And you can see that these are all the components. I can just place them wherever. We've got this huge sheet. I'm just going to click there. 
and now we can zoom in and we can see all of the various uh, components. So you've got the, the module is here. Uh, then we have, this is our reset switch. I'm gonna just kind of place things it around roughly where the schematic is. Most of these components don't really matter their location except for the, the, the Bluetooth microcontroller module here. This antenna portion, which is here, we don't see any pads, this is the antenna. And this needs to be along one edge of the board and it needs to be in the middle of the board. I believe the spec is there's, it needs to be 10 uh, millimeters on each side before you get to the edge of the board. So let me pull up the data sheet on that. So there's a data sheet for this module, but there's also an implementation guide that's got a few more, that's got more details in it. So this is the implementation guide for this UBlox Bluetooth module that we are using. And uh, I'm on page 40 here. And what you can see is make sure that you look under, because this implementation guide includes different versions of this module. You want the NINA-B3X6 or 306. And that's the one that has the built-in antenna. So we have to make sure that we follow the guidelines for the module with the built-in antenna. And you can see here that you have to, there's a, a couple, two, couple rules. First of all, this antenna edge needs to, be along the edge of one side of the board and you also you don't want it near the corner of the board they're showing that it needs to be greater than 10 millimeters from the edge of the board so that's the one of the main requirements and then the other requirement is you don't want you can't have any ground underneath this antenna and that's called a, a ground clearance zone and I'll, I'll show you how to do that here they are giving the dimensions of the ground clearance zone so it needs to be eight millimeters by 3.1 millimeters uh, so you, you definitely want to make sure you follow this closely otherwise your antenna is not going to work or you're going to have extremely limited range Okay, now that we know where our module needs to go, we can begin placing the components. So I'm gonna move this module over here. So we'll place it along, this will be our edge of our board. So the board shape will kind of be something like this. So that's the most critical component on this uh, design in regards to placement. Now all the other components are a little bit flexible except for the USB connector needs to also be along an edge. And there are like, uh, I'll get into that in a moment, but there are a, some other placement uh, things that are critical that I'll, I'll touch on as well. But the main component that's really critical is the module itself. Okay, so I'm gonna just move our reset switch over here. Then we have our, yeah, this is the USB. So I'm gonna rotate that around. So this will be the other edge of the board, the vertical edge here. So the USB connector has to go right up against that edge. Then we have our, this is our programming port. This is a header, so you can plug it from up, from above. It's not like a side plug, like a USB. So this one doesn't have to be along a board edge. We can pretty much put that anywhere. Then we have our U3, which is our little uh, temperature humidity sensor. That can be placed pretty much anywhere. And then we have U1. This is our power regulator, our linear converter regulator that takes five volts and steps it down to 3.3. So let's just kind of place that up in the corner. Then we have, this is our ESD protection for our USB port. So I'm gonna kind of move that in here. We'll probably have to scoot this out. And then these are just our two little LEDs that we've got. Then uh, I'm gonna go back to the schematic. So we're gonna start up here. So we need L1, C1, and C3. So let's see here. We're gonna need, I believe this is L1. So I'm gonna put that here. Then we've got C1. And then we're, I think this is C3. They're a little hard to read when they're overlapping. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna just move these out of the way because we're just gonna keep grabbing from those. So I don't want those to kind of inflate the board size because we're gonna be moving those off uh, 
in, uh, be moving each of those components over into various circuits. So they're not going to be all piled up like that. And turn, there, turn off the rats nest, which is the lines that show how things connect. I'm not a big fan of that. I find it distracting. So I'm going to move this connector route here. And we are not, because I don't want to, if, one thing that really can drastically complicate the PCB layout is if you want things packed really tightly. And for this tutorial, I'm not going to focus on packing things tightly because that just requires that you're constantly checking minimum spacing and that you have to really, it just takes more effort to get things tight. You can do a PCB layout a lot quicker if you don't really care too much about how, much, how big the board is so you don't have to pack everything so tight. Okay, so I'm going to select this and rotate this around to here. Then, okay, C3, I'm going to rotate that around also. These are the, the go with the ferrite bead here. And let's uh, maybe move all this a little bit this way. Let me move this part number up here. You kind of have to be careful you don't want like your reference designators, like the C1, L1, or the part numbers or anything to, to overlap because you won't be able to read them on the board, but you also don't want them to be over any of the pads uh, because when the pads are opened up, you'll lose the reference designator. So if this one was over the red pad here, then that would not be visible on the board. So I'm going to just... Uh, And let's see, maybe I'll just move it here, there, okay. Um, and let's just move that where nothing's touching. Okay, so now I'm going to connect up the USB, and I'm trying to find uh, which pin. I'm going to go back to the schematic. It's pin 31 is, goes to the B bus. And we're, oh, pin 31, it's one of these internal pins. Um, so what we're going to have to do is I'm probably going to put it via here because it's unless we use some really narrow routing, I don't think there's enough room to route through here. So with this type of package where you've got pins underneath of it, you kind of have to get creative sometimes. So I'll put it via here. So we'll route VBus to the via and then connect it up to, to uh, pin 31. Okay, so now I'm going to just start connecting routing. So I can just select here. And you can see here when I'm drawing a trace, it is just showing the outline instead of showing the full trace. And you can change that, go under view, drawing mode, and turn off sketch tracks. And then, then it will show them filled, which is what I would want it, is what I want it to be. Okay, so then we've got that. Now I'm going to just keep routing things up. So I'm going to go here. And then now we have to tie... If I, you can see it goes to here, but we can't get there through these other paths. So that's what we're going to have to do a via for. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, so I'm on the top layer now. I'm going to just click right here and I'm going to place a via through via right here. And now on the bottom side and can route from here, now we're going to go right about here. And now I'm going to place another via. And now we can connect up our pad. So you can see it's here on metal, it's on the top metal layer. It goes to it vias to the bottom layer. So this blue is on the bottom side, so it can go underneath the part. Then it vias back up to the top layer and connects into the USB. And so all the, the traces I'm using here, I'm just using, these are all uh, set to, I believe, 6 mils is the width, which is fine for what we're doing here. Uh, that, that can handle a, a couple hundred milliamps of current. If you want to find out how wide a trace has to be, then you can go to a website let's like um for pcb or let me do just if you just google pcb calc or trace with calculator 
then you can, uh, the 4pcb.com is the one that I like to use. This one here. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, review, you can uh, set, you can, this will tell you how, how wide a trace needs to be to uh, allow a certain current. So just as an example, I'm gonna just set this to one amp. Let's say this is our thickness of the copper. We're gonna, let's do uh, 1.5 on this, which is somewhere usually this is between one and two, but you can go higher or lower. This is ounces per square feet, which correlates to basically a thickness. You could convert this. You could also enter this in mils as a thickness or millimeters or microns. And you can see here they're showing if we have one amp of current and we have 1.5 ounces per square foot of copper, then this is how much that trace can rise in temperature because what happens if you put too much current through the trace, it heats up, it actually melts open and then current can't flow. So right now I've just got this set to the default of 10 degrees C that it can rise. Uh, don't worry about the trace length, that's only important if you need to know the resistance. And you can see here, let me, I'm gonna take this down to say a half an amp now. So if you have a half amp current, if you have an external layer, the routing only needs to be three mils wide. We're six mils wide. So we could do, we can, we're like almost, I mean, not quite, but we're getting close to almost being able to do an amp of current through the traces that we're, that we're using. And notice it's a lot, the internal layers can't carry as much current because they don't get airflow, so they, they get hotter quicker. External layers have airflow, so they cool off faster, so you can put more current through the same trace width. We're only doing two layers, which so we have a top and a bottom, and they're both external. So we are, we would, these are the numbers that we need to look at here. So I'm gonna just kind of tweak this. This tool doesn't let you enter the width and tell you the current, it goes the other way. But you can see we can almost do 800 milliamps or 0.8 amps on our traces uh, for the six mil. So we are good to go. We're not gonna be pulling anywhere near that, that type of current. Let me see, I could uh, maybe move this a little bit closer. Oops, let's just disconnect that and move this a little bit closer. Okay, and then I'm gonna go top layer on the front. Okay, there we go, we have that. And now we need to, this is our ESD. So the ESD protection you wanna place as close to the external pin, not necessarily to the pin that it's protecting. So in this case, we want the ESD to be near our connector where this connects as close as possible and not necessarily at the, uh, at the, the pin of the microcontroller itself. Okay, so I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna rotate this, or, whoops, not that, the whole thing. And yeah, let's do that. And then I'll maybe move this kind of down here to get it out of the way. So I'm gonna just route, we have uh, the minus, goes to here. Um, we have the plus, we're gonna probably have to, um, let me see if I, if I rotated that uh, away. Yeah, we're gonna have to via to get to that one. So I'm just gonna do a place it through via here. And then we can just look at here, like that, and then connect like that. Okay, so we've got the two there. Then we have our, this uh, B USB also needs to connect. And for that, I'm gonna just route it right through that. Um, got a little weird little bump here. Let me see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Okay. Then we still need to route our, uh, to our USB input pins. Let's see what pins for the data. Um, is what I'm looking for for the two data pins, which are 54 and 55. Oops. Okay, which are these two guys here. Okay, let's see. And ideally you want these two to be uh, pretty much this, the same length, so you don't have 
uh, like what's called a race condition where if one takes a longer route because electricity doesn't travel instantaneously, doesn't even travel at the speed of light. So if you have a, a tr one trace that's a lot further away or a longer distance, then that signal can take a little bit longer to get there. Um, so with, uh, yeah, okay, so let's, uh, let's see here. We're going to probably have to, I'm going to get a little bit hard already to get those out. I guess I could just, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do some more vias, I think. So let me try to see if I can get this guy out of the way where I can more clearly access these two pins. It's okay if the traces cross over this die designator, that's not anything to be concerned about. Okay, so I'm gonna just go here and I'm gonna go, uh, oh, no, I didn't mean that. Here, place through via. And let's see, we should be able to, I um. Okay, so I'm just gonna move this via right there. Okay, so it connects to the minus, comes up through a via, goes to metal, the bottom may metal, then it vias back up and connects right here to the D minus. Let's move this up a little bit. Okay, now we're gonna do the same thing. Let's, uh, we need a little more space here. I'm gonna move this up. Okay, so let's go back top layer, and we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to try to make these very similar. Except I don't, I need to go this way. And then we are actually do a B, another via here instead of tying into the same one. Okay. There we go. Okay, so those are pretty similar. They both connect in, and then we have the ESD protection. Okay, I think that is mostly it for the connector. Let's we could go ahead and quickly just connect all of the grounds together, and then we can just tie it to this ground pad here. So this will all get picked up. Any of the grounds, I'm not going to be connecting up manually we'll instead connect those up with a copper pour and then we can go back and connect up any grounds that the copper pour did not connect up uh, so that includes the ground for the shield and the ground for these diodes okay let's uh, go back to our schematic and see what we've got next so we've got this all basically all this connected up now we have our led d2 r1 goes to pin one. Okay. So uh, D2 here and D2, let's go find R1. So we can just route once again. We can just use minimum. It's fine. And we can just add uh, this here. Route. Those are connected. And let's move our R1 designator there. Okay, so there we have our diode through the resistor, and then that will connect to ground. Now let's go back to the schematic. And okay, we could go ahead. Let's go ahead and do this other diode. So D3, R2 goes to pin 41. Oops. Okay, D3, R2, and it was, uh, goes to pin 41, okay. Where is pin 41? Hopefully, I did kind of pick one a little awkward to get to. It's right here, but we'll just do it via here, and then we can connect into it. Okay, so where did our diode go? Let's move this over here. Okay. And just rotate it. So this top side is going to go to the power supply. Let's uh, do this here. And then it doesn't really matter how I rotate it. That. That's going to connect there. And let's uh, actually move this 
because it's this here is going to connect to pin 41, see, right there, but we, we're going to have to uh, via to get to it. So we're going to come here. I'm going to just go down to here. I'm going to do a V, uh, place VA. You can do just a shift V also. It's a lot quicker than doing the keyboard like I'm doing. Okay. Now we're on the bottom layer. So we'll go right here. We got to come back up and connect to the top layer to be able to access that pin. There we go. Okay. So we've got that other diode connected up. Back to the schematic. What we have, let's uh, maybe, okay, well, let's go ahead and do six and seven. See our two decoupling capacitors. So C6 or seven and eight go to pins nine and 10. Oops. I don't mean to route. Okay. So we got seven. And those are going to go to here by wherever pins 9 and 10 are, which are down here. Okay. And for these, these are decoupling capacitors, so you want them to be as close as possible to the pin that they're protecting. So this first one, I'm going to rotate it around. And we're going to put that here. And this other one, rotate it around. And we'll kind of, you don't want to, you want to make sure you don't put it so close. See, it starts to see how that turned red because now those two parts are going to be on top of each other and that's not going to work. I'm going to try to get it close, but best to not push it too much. And we'll probably have to move these things all around at some point to get, uh, get it where it's not overlapping other stuff. There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead, connect these up and go here. And then we're going to go here. And then also these two are going to short together. So we can, let's just uh, short them here. Okay. So there's our two decoupling capacitors. We still have to connect the power to them, but there's our two decoupling capacitors. Let's, um, you know, actually instead, that's, yeah, I'm not, let's not connect it there. Let's, we'll connect the supply here and the supply here. Then that way, because you normally want the supply to go through the decoupling or to go by the decoupling capacitor before it goes to the pin. Okay, back to the schematic. Now we have R3, C9 are part of our push button. Okay, so R3, C9, R3, C9. There they are, those two little guys right there. And which pin was reset? Pin 19. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so let's go ahead and just move. I'm going to leave these out here because these just really do not, uh, their, their placement is not at all important. Um, they can be just placed wherever it's convenient for you. So like that, um, let me see what is back here. Chime, uh, okay. Hey, I'm gonna turn off my sound. Okay. All right, so I'm going to, let's move this actually over here a little bit. These can be on this side, because that's where the, I'm just gonna, there we go. Okay, so we're going to route. This is the reset line here. You can see all the places it connects up. So it's a fairly easy one to route. And you can see that it also goes to our programming connector. Let's go and just connect that up. Oops. That's, uh, where did I go? Okay. There's a few things about KiCad I'm not I'm not entirely used to. I tend to use a different software. Let's uh, fix that corner. There we go. Okay, so there we have our reset lines all connected up to our everything that the RC, this reset switch, and the programming connector. Okay, back to the schematic. We've got all this connected, all this. Okay, now I think we are ready to begin our routing some of this other stuff. So let's go ahead and do 
uh, U3, which is our temperature humidity sensor, and we need C10 and C11 next to it. Okay, so I'm going to go grab C. Whoops, did not. C10, C11. Okay. Um, those, those are going to go next to this guy here. We can, I'm going to just move this. And let's not print now, actually. Let's see if these will fit in here. That goes to that pin. Oops. And once again, you, you want these, uh, these, cap these capacitors, uh, decoupling capacitors, you want as close as possible to the pin. Okay, this one goes on that pin. Okay. So that I have our little part number. Let's put it right there. Put that out of the way. It's, I think okay. Okay, and we're just going to connect these up real quick. That goes there. That goes there. Okay, that's the only component. We still have to connect up, you know, like the, the power has to connect to this and our two communication lines. I'm just trying to get all the, the components hooked up except for mainly except for the power, the ground, and then any like the I2C lines that have to route between two components. Okay, let's see what we've got. We've got uh, these. Okay, we still have our two pull-up resistors for our I2C. Once again, those can be placed anywhere. So I'm going to just move those here. And uh, one thing also to keep in mind is this has to be the edge of the board and you can see I've got things below the edge of the board which obviously is not going to work so we're going to have to move some of this I don't there may not be room for that full part number I'm going to just, just kind of put it there for now and let's see here we're going to have to probably redo this line here um, although let me see if I can uh, just move this up a little bit more yeah. and then move this up. We still got this here. It can go over the traces is okay. Okay, that gets it off the edge of the board. Now we just have to move that C8 there. And we also going to have to, I'm going to not exactly I did, let me maybe rotate that around and rotate C8. This becomes a little more uh, complex and troublesome when it's uh, when you have really tight board space, even fitting the uh, reference designators and things in there can be a little bit uh, painful. Okay. I'm going to move that just so those don't overlap. So these are our two pull up resistors. And those, I don't really care where they're at. So we'll connect those up in a moment. Yeah, okay, so let's do our power now. That's the only thing left is the power regulator as far as like a sub circuit to connect up. Okay, back to the schematic. We've got C2, C4 go on the input. And the input goes to the VUSB, you can see, so C2. And you want these as close to the pin as possible. C2, C4. And, and then back to the schematic, C5 is the bypass, okay. Just leave that, like, let's leave like that. And then yeah, this one also, I'm going to rotate this one up because uh, ground does definitely not have to always be on the bottom side. You can put components upside down. That's not a problem. Electricity doesn't care about orientation in most cases. Okay, now let's just do a quick little routing here. here I'm going to grab both of those and we got the V out here. Bypass there and then Oh, then we have this pin here is the enable pin. Let's go back to the schematic. Pin three, and we're just going to tie that high. 
this uh, does not carry any current, so it does not matter the the width of it at all. Not that it not that any of these we're still using minimum trace width. None of these are really critical, but especially like an enable, uh, it just has zero current that flows through that trace, so that could definitely be real minimal. Okay. And let's zoom out and see what we've got here. Okay, I think, you know, I'm going to probably get rid of that. I don't think that's just taking way too much space up. Okay, so now we just have to finish routing some of our stuff. So I'm going to move myself back over here and let's, let's start. Let's uh, zoom in on our SDA for the I2C and just see where all we have to go with it. Uh, yeah, we can grab that one pretty easy. And let's zoom in here. I probably violated some rules. Hmm, doesn't look too bad. I'm gonna scoot, scoot that guy over a little bit. That guy over a little bit. And there we go. Okay, so that connects up our to our pull-up resistors, but we still need to connect to our sensor here. So we've got the SCL line. Let's just click on that. Let's see where we got to get this baby. Okay. We're going to um, probably, yeah, we're going to just via. Let's do a via. Place via. I'm just going to go to the bottom layer and then place a, another via. There we go. Now let's do, that. I think that was the clock for the I2C. Now let's do the same thing again. I'm just going to be here. Let's go down a little bit. And we got over this way and through the again. Okay. And I'm going to take a scan at the schematic. We've got this connected. Oh, we need to connect up these two lines here from our programming, our native programming connector. So you got 3.3, that we'll, we'll worry about power supply, ground, ground, reset, and then um, what are the two pins that we need to connect? We need pin four and two. Okay, so we got pin two. I'm going to just start routing and see where we have to go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to place a via. Didn't go to the bottom side. Now I'm going to go through here. And, hmm. Let's see here, because what we have to do is we have to be careful. We can't can't have any signals in this area here. So we've got to get up to a via up here. What we're going to have to do, I think, is I'm going to make a little room in there. Okay, and yeah, okay, so I'm going to go here to a via as close as possible. It's the same net, so it doesn't matter if they touch. Okay, then, then connect there. Okay, so that's, oh, let me go ahead and, oops, uh, I need to go onto metal one, top layer, I mean, there we go. And I believe this is our other one over here. So we're going to do the same thing, connect here, place it via, here, go through here, through there, and just go, whoops, okay, we could just, let's do, go this way, and just do here, then I'll do a via, and draw, and I can connect that up. Okay, I think we have them all connected. Yep. Okay, so that is everything we've got connected. Now it is just a matter of 
mainly connecting up the grounds and the power supply. I do see one here. I did not connect up the VDD ENV for U3. So let's go and do that. That's going to tie to pin 49. Let's here we go, pin 49, top layer. And where do we have to get with that? We gotta get way down there. Well, let's just uh it's not really important because it's low current, so let's just uh so we can kind of route a little bit uh longer. Doesn't really matter. Um, now we're gonna have to do a couple vias because we gotta cross over a top and bottom layer. Oops, I'm gonna go to the bottom layer. Okay, but now if I keep going, see it won't let me rock past that because that will interfere, that will short with the other net. So now I'm gonna do another via. And now I'm back to the top layer. I can connect that up. And let's uh, get rid of that little imperfection there. Okay. Can make this a lot tighter. Okay, I think that is all of our connections. Now we can, uh, the next thing is I'm gonna start doing a copper pour that should grab most of the ground connections. We still have to connect, actually let's go ahead and connect up the, the various power supplies because we're gonna need to do that. So we've got, let me just go do this on the layout. Okay, so we've got, here's our power to our programming connector. I'm just gonna select that. Oops, I'm going to be on top metal, front metal. And let's see what all we got to go grab. Okay, but let's actually take it from here. So this is the this is the output. So this is the source of the 3.3 volt. And okay, I've got that big piece of metal there that's kind of making me have to via across things. You know, I'm going to, let's just get rid of that. And I'm going to place a via here, a via here. And now I'm going to connect these up on the bottom layer. There. Okay. Now I can route these up, this other, and just stay on the, the top metal. Once again, these are all low current stuff, so I'm not at all really paying much attention. I could even tap this off here, but in general, it's good practice a lot of times to go back to the the source. That way, any current through here won't affect what is happening over here. Because even though these connections look like perfect connections, they're not. These are all really small resistors, essentially, because they're not, it's not a superconductor. So each line is going to have some resistance to it and the, the longer they are and the more narrow they are, the higher the, the resistance is gonna be. So if you just have to keep that in mind, if this has a lot of current going through it, then that's a resistor and there's gonna be a voltage drop. So whatever, if I tapped off at this point, then it's not gonna be 3.3, it may be 3.2 because we dropped 0.1 volts across this line here due to the resistance. But uh, that's not the case here. We have a pretty simple design. Okay, so let's see, uh, let me go, I'm going to select that again so I can see where all I have to route. Okay, we still need to, let's go ahead and open it actually and see if I can see. Okay, this way I've got enough for a via. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna redo this one. Oh, I okay. So, yeah, I threw it down this via, and the problem is, is that I didn't tell it what it's connected to, and so the uh, keycat is not letting me route to it because it thinks it's on a different net. So what I'm gonna instead do is I'm gonna try this again, and come down here, and we'll go here. 
And then I'm going to just via. Okay, then I can via again and connect there. And notice I'm selecting uh, through vias, not blind or buried vias. Those were another option that you'll see. Let me just uh, do a route here. You can see uh, if I do a right click, you can see place. There's a place through via or place blind buried via. In almost all cases, you're going to want to do a through via. Uh, blind and buried vias are only really essential if you are trying to squeeze every little millimeter out of the, the, the board size and make it super small, but they're going to add a lot of cost to your prototyping cost. Uh, through vias go through all the layers on the board, regardless if that layer connects to the via. Blind and buried vias allow you to make vias that don't go through all the layers, so they don't take up any space on the layers that aren't using them. But you have to be really uh, striving to get really tight layout for that to, to be anything that's uh, worth the extra cost of it. Okay, so we've got that connected up to our power supply. I'm gonna, once again, I'm gonna just, this is kind of my way of seeing what all we have to connect. We have our two pull-ups over here, and then this is our power for the, that actually powers the module, which is what most of the power is gonna be used for. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna route from here, and, and once again, if this was a design where I cared about space, I, I probably wouldn't be extending the board without just for this one trace. I would instead use vias and go through this that way there. Uh, but for this, that's uh, size is not really important, so we're just going to keep it small. Okay. Okay, I think that, okay, we still have our power here. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to tie. Let's move this down a little bit. And I am going to route from here, but I'm going to place a via. Okay, so we have the, the via, yeah, here's the via going to the power. Now what we can do is route, the, we gotta get the power from here. I mean, we, we could just tap off of here. We've got the power. Uh, however, uh, I didn't really optimize this particular trace for any current. Now, these pull-up resistors aren't really critical. So, and once again, because we're using uh, even this, the module is gonna be pr is really low current. Uh, for what we're doing here. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just to keep this simple, I am going to go ahead, I'm going to get rid of this via, and I'm going to just go ahead and we'll just connect in. Uh, let's just, oh, we got to connect it over here. Okay. So this is a case where, okay, we're pulling current, let's say the, the module's pulling current, so that pulls current through this long trace here, and that's a resistor, so the, the voltage here could be a little bit less than 3.3. In fact, it, it will be, but it shouldn't be low enough that it's going to have any impact. Okay, I think that's all of our routing now except for ground. And to do ground, we're going to do what are called copper pores. So I'll just basically place a big square piece of copper and tell it to fill it. And I'll tell it it's connected to ground, and it will fill it. So it only touches, it connects anything to ground, but anything else that doesn't go to ground, it will not connect to. So before we do the copper pores, the first thing we have to do is create this uh, no ground or no signal of any type, especially ground underneath the antenna. And in fact, we're gonna have to move this particular line here so that it doesn't uh, interfere with this, uh, this no, uh, ground zone especially. Okay, so I'm gonna move this up, let's do it like that. Okay, and to, in KiCad, to draw the uh, no ground zone, we're gonna add a rule area, and we're gonna zoom in and select the first corner that we wanna draw, be right there. And we're gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say the two copper, the top and the bottom, front and back, 
just call it no ground. It's going to keep out all tracks, all vias, all pads, all copper fills and uh, footprints. That doesn't matter. We're going to leave that alone. And we'll hash and let's do fully hatched. Okay. And then I'm going to do okay. So now we're going to draw the other and it needs to be, I'm going to just kind of draw it approximately here, but it needs to be the dimensions that are specified in the implement, oops, in the implementation guide for the module, which was eight millimeters by 3.1. Here I'm going to right click and do close outline. Okay. So now we have the, the ground clearance area. So no grounds will be routed through here. And if we try to, then we'll get an error. Okay, now the next step is we are going to draw the copper pores themselves. So I'm going to do place and um, it's called a filled zone in KiCad. And I'm just going to start here in the upper corner because I'm not particularly worried about the board size. So first thing we need to do is connect it to which net. I'm going to connect it to ground. I'm going to select both copper layers, no ground, hatched. Uh, I've got the, uh, some of the other, the traces we, I didn't set to six mils, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and set the clearance and the minimum width for this to six mils, which is pretty standard minimum uh, from a, a lot of PCB processes. By having this smaller, it just allows the copper fill to reach more areas and the, there's less likelihood of a pin not connecting to ground. Uh, pad connections, I'm just going to do, it probably defaults to thermal reliefs. We're not going to do that. I don't want to, uh, that's an advanced topic. Uh, so I'm just doing solid, uh, solid fill and I'm going to do okay. And now it's going to have me finish drawing it. And once again, I'm kind of just going to wing this for now. We can adjust it as needed. This is uh, not going to be a perfect rectangle, but we can always, uh, we can always fix this. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on it. I'm going to go under zones and I'm going to go fill all zones. And it created both a top and bottom copper fill. And it should have connected to all of the ground pins. So I'm going to, so we're on the top. So we're looking at the red areas or copper on this side. You can kind of ignore any of the blue that you see. So you can see that this red, this copper here, it went up. See how it grabbed this ground pin? You see the red, there's metal all around it and it connects versus these other traces or pit pads it doesn't connect to then you see there's a space around it so it doesn't connect here it grabbed the ground there it grabbed the ground okay and then the last thing i'm going to do before we start doing some verifications is i'm going to go select edge cuts and i'm going to just draw a board outline and just kind of not doing anything we'll kind of have to deal with the edge here at the bottom because that's important Okay, uh, let's see if I can that and you're probably going to have to move that because you can't have a copper fill, can't be right at the edge of the board. It has a spacing requirement, uh, kind of just like everything else. Now, if you were doing this as a full design, you know, that you were going to really manufacture, then you, you know, want to clean these up and make sure you have uniform spacing. I'm, I just don't want to fixate on that type of thing because that just takes up time and that's uh, not really that important. And I'm sure you can figure out how to uh, uh, fix the corners and make it, it perfect. I'm kind of more focused on the the fundamentals of what you need to do and not some of the, you know, getting the spacing exactly right. Okay. And I'm going to right click again, zones, fill all zones. Okay. Now we are technically 
the, I think the PCB layout is done, but of course I'm sure there are mistakes and we're gonna, we're gonna find some. I'm, I'm like everyone else, I'm far from perfect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go under uh, inspect and we're gonna go under design rules checker. And, and then we can just do, once again, I'm gonna focus mainly on the errors. And these are rules that uh, that you would want to set up based on whatever PCB process you're using. So whoever is going to manufacture your PCB, whatever manufacturer you go with, then you would probably want to find out what rule set that they have. You can you can pretty much you know uh, if you needed a, a special combination, you can do uh, custom rules with a, a PCB manufacturer. But a lot of them will give you a a discount if you follow one particular set of rules, like maybe uh, you know something that's a 10 mil wide trace minimum instead of six mils or something like that. So that can uh, be a, a little bit of discount. But the point is, is you need to make sure that the PCB rules you're using to check your design match what you're using to manufacture it. So I'm gonna just do run DRC and I'm sure we're gonna get all kinds of fun stuff. Hey, not too bad. We got uh we only got uh six or we got six errors and one warning. That is actually not too bad. Okay, so what it's doing here is it's saying we have some see all these grounds, so ground, 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 ground. Uh, so all of these except this first one be used. Oh, okay, I, I think I see why they're uh yeah, the, these all these ground ones are basically where the copper port couldn't get to grab the, the, the ground pads. So we have to go through and fix those, either manually ground them or, you know, shift things around so the copper port can actually get in there and ground things. So I'm going to focus on this first error first, which is uh, L1. And what I think maybe happened, let's see. Uh, Yeah, the, the B USB. let's uh, highlight that net just to see where all it goes, okay. So we just have it going to the input, we have it going there, and then it goes to L1. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna take a look at the layout and see where we have a missing connection. So it's saying pad one of L1 does not seem like it is being, Connected. Oh, okay. Um, actually, right here, we never connected up the USB line to our linear regulator, so that's why it was it was recognizing that there wasn't the right things connected to this USB line. So I'm going to just do a trace here, and now I'm going to redo the copper pour. There, and you can see now it carved out around that because this is not ground. I didn't want that shorted into uh, the, the copper port, okay? Now I'm going to go inspect. Let's just delete all the markers and run again. I think we should have, yeah, we got one less error now. So the rest of these are all just ground issues and these can be kind of problematic, kind of a pain to, to find uh, in the design. Uh, I typically, I, I've used other software that I like a little better that seems to give you a little better indication on trying to find these uh, versus KiCad, but we need to, we're just gonna have to go find uh, where we can see ground not being connected up. One of the first things though that we can do before we uh, start looking at each of those ground connections that are missing is we need to add some ground vias that connect because the problem is now we've got we have a, a top layer copper pour and a bottom layer copper pour that are both connected to ground but i've not really added vias to connect them in various places so that just will help you get a soft, more solid ground but it also will help maybe solve some of these missing grounds because what you can have is let's say for instance made this big area here that's tying to ground. Maybe it couldn't tie into, connect into the main ground with the other copper pour. So then you just get components connected to this ground, but the, that ground's not connected to the other ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just, I'm gonna place a via, 
Okay, so I'm gonna just click one here, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select it and do a properties on it, and make sure it's connected to ground because that's that's what we want. We want it connected to ground. So now what I can do is I can just copy it and place it. So I'm just gonna kind of oops, come on down. Oops. Just kind of place these. I'm just doing a control C and then a control V, just a like a regular piece, like you would anything. If you're on a Windows PC, which I am. Okay, let's just uh Okay, it seems like that should have grabbed kind of all the big areas. Let's see anything there. Oh, and then we gotta have some here. And put one here. Connect up that ground. It's not connected. We already have one there. Okay, so now that we've done that, I'm going to I'm gonna try to redo the copper pores. Okay, and let's rerun our check and see if we reduced it any from five to the don't markers. So these are the ground missing ground connections. So we got that down to five. Uh, I think it was the last, we got it down to three, but now we have a clearance violation where we have put one of the ground vias too close to, it looks like too close to the SDA line for the I2C. Okay, so let's uh, see, it should, yeah, there's the air right there. Uh, okay, there we go. This via right here is the one causing the problem. Does that even need to be there? I kind of already have the ground via here and here. We could move that up, see if that helped any. Okay, let me redo all the zones, refill them. Let's try running the check again. Okay, track has an unconnected end. Sure, because that definitely is connected. There, okay. I think what is, I think there's, sometimes you'll get these little, you know, like a, when I'm routing or something, I mess up and there's maybe a little piece of a route a trace that's still there. And you can do a cleanup tracks of vias. Let's see if this uh, will get rid of um, yeah, saying remove track not connected at both ends. Yes. Okay. Now let me try this again. We got rid of that. Now we're just down to three missing ground connections. Okay. We are getting close now. Okay. So for the missing ground connections, what I like to do is I just go through each component, look at the ground pins and make sure that everything that they were actually able to connect up to the ground. So here we have these grounds. You can tell they're grabbed. They go to these vias. So we know they have a good ground connection. Uh, then we have this ground pin here, which connects up through here to the via. So it's connected there, but it also goes here. So those are grounded good. Same here, there's a ground. Here's a ground that ties in. Let's scroll down here and then we have this ground. And let me see, yeah, it connects to ground through here. So that's okay. Uh, we have the ground for the programming connector. You can see that connects to that ground, so that's okay. This ground is okay. Uh, we have the ground for our sensor. It ties into this via, so that's it should have a good ground. These grounds here are connected. And this comes up, this grabs these grounds, these two grounds here, get the via, connected that up. Um, then we have these two grounds here, 
Well, they come up, grab all these, but they go through these ground vias. So those are okay. Oh, there's, I think, uh, no, let me see. Is this, uh, so this grabs these two ground pins, and then you have a ground, you have a ground via here. So that should be okay. So far, I'm not seeing where, oh, here's one right here. See this little island here? It's totally isolated. So we need a via there. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna take this via and just copy it and put it right there. Now we can do our design rules checker again. Run, uh, let's just delete any old ones and run again. Hey, we're down to two. Okay, that got rid of one. Okay, so for the final two missing grounds, let's zoom in on this chip here because this is most likely where we have the missing, we have ground connections not being connected. So these two grounds go up and grab that via. Ah, uh, here we go. See this ground pin here? There's a copper port, but there's no, it's isolated. So we need, we need a via right there. Okay, that will fix that one. Uh, oh, here's another one. So we have, see how we have this connects up here, but there, it, it doesn't actually ever tie into ground. So we're going to have to find a way to tie that into ground, and we're going to have to make some room in here because there's, I don't think there's, there's not going to be enough space to get a via in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to turn off or unfill all the zones so I can see better to route. And so let's uh, move this like that. That, I think that should be okay. Let's go ahead and go like that. And we'll move that like that. And now we can do a copy of via. I think I can get it in here without it giving me an error, a violation. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna fill all zones. And let's do another design rules track. Delete the markers, run the RC. Hey, there we go. Okay, we have zero errors and zero warnings. And we've also, you can see here this option, it says test for parity between PCB and schematic. That is gonna, that will give you errors if the connect, the way you've connected things on the PCB don't match the way they're connected in the schematic. We don't have any errors, so we are good to go. Okay, so the the final steps, so we've, we've designed the PCB, that's sort of the, the main thing I want to focus on, but if you need to order boards, you've got to know how to do that. So what we're going to do is you can go under export, oh, I'm sorry, fabrication outputs, go under fabrication outputs, and there are several files that we're going to output. You'll output Gerber files, so a Gerber file will give you a separate file for each layer on the board so there'll be a Gerber file file for the top copper the bottom copper the top silk screen bottom silk screen so uh, that's what's going to happen here so I'm going to just uh, leave all the defaults and it's going to select it's selected these default layers and I'm just going to do plot okay so that created those uh, that oh I didn't uh, out you want to have an output directory so let's just say uh, let me just select a, I'm just going to, let's just put them under this keycad directory. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to put them under the root directory for now. Yes, yeah, so, okay. So plot, and that's going to output those files. And then the other files, so fabrication outputs. The other files you need are drill a drill file, and that's going to basically show the location of every via because every time there's a via you have they have to drill a hole so this file will contain the xy coordinates and the sizes for all of the via holes that need to be drilled so generate drill file okay and fabrication uh, next you need a, a component the last well the second to last thing you need is a component placement and what this will generate is you can output you know like a cbs file 
or ASCII, I typically just do CBS. And what this will do is this will generate just a, a, a output file that gives the X, Y and coordinates and orientation for all of the components. So this is what will be used by the pick and place machine for automatic manufacturing that they'll place the parts down. And then the final thing you want to output is your bill of materials. And that also will be a spreadsheet. And you're, you're probably going to, the bill of materials created by the, the tools only as good as what you've inputted. So you have to make sure you have all the part numbers and everything in there for it to give you a good bill of materials. If you found this video helpful, then definitely check out this video here, which is a masterclass workshop showing you how to design a, an entire electronic product, including both the electronics and the enclosure design.